you. <clears throat> okay, so it was 10 o'clock on a Friday, and uh, this is the Back to Pulp seminar, so that hopefully that's where you want to be. If uh, not, run now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Curtis. That's right. So uh, there's, um, yeah, so the topic is, yeah, Back to Pulp, and then uh, really, um, I guess it says, Pulp is back, so that's actually a declaration in itself we could, we could discuss. Uh, why is it, and, and, and how, you, how, do you, um, how do you do it right? So, um, so I'm Seth Lindbergh. I'll be moderating. I'm a, a coordinator of uh, the uh, Writer Symposium this year. And um, so the way we're going to run this is, first we'll do some introductions in a moment, and we'll discuss their, uh, all the panelists' uh, connections to, to Pulp and their interest in that. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll dig into the topic. We'll aim for roughly about 30 minutes-ish of chatting. Um, and then we'll kind of bleed into questions from the crowd, um, assuming if you have them. Um, at that time, uh, if you can't try to keep your questions more to actual questions than uh, 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 long-winded comments, which happens occasionally. But uh, the, um, uh, you can just raise your hand or, or something at that time, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wing it from there till the end. And uh, we'll save like the last five minutes or so for some closing comments. And uh, we're trying to end about five or 10 minutes before the hour to make sure we can clear out. Uh, so we're, we'll just kind of, uh, anyway, I'll moderate the time and uh, just holler if we get off track. So um, we'll start off first by uh, introducing our guests and it's better for them to do it than me, though I, I think I know them. We'll start off at the end with uh, Richard. Okay, I'm Richard Lee Byers. I write uh, fantasy and horror, mainly a lot of people. I think they'll be best for driving around these books I did a while back. My two most recent books are uh, Two Marvel Legends of Asgard novels. Uh, you can pick those up at um, the Miniature Mart, which is on uh, aisle eight of the, the exhibitor hall, and all the copies are autographed. If you catch me later in the time, I will gladly personalize those for you. And the third book in the trilogy comes out October 6th. Okay. Uh, I'm Jason Ray Kearney. I'm an uh, academic um, and fiction writer. Um, I wrote an academic book on uh, Weird Tales, um, the history of Weird Tales, uh, and um, Whetstone. Uh, oh, yeah, I am the, uh, <laughs> I'm the editor of uh, Whetstone, <laughs> the <laughs> magazine of uh, Pulp Sword and Sorcery. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. 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 yeah, that's quite it. Really happy to be here. Multiple award winner for his work with the. Uh, oh, the, the Robert Howard, Howard Foundation. Yeah. Member of the Robert Howard Foundation. <laughs> 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 I, I feel like we just need to crowdsource all our files. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I think next we should start having the, the uh, one one panel to introduce the other one. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Jane Gates. I got my start in fantasy and science fiction when I picked up a David Gimmel book by accident. I had, knew nothing about him. I just randomly picked him up, and that was kind of one of my big uh, influences right alongside Tolkien. So Sword and Sorcery is kind of in my background. Um, I've been an editor and author for years. Uh, a number of years ago, I got a panel together, including uh, the next guest to introduce himself uh, <laughs> at World Fantasy to talk about sword and sorcery for about an hour. Uh, there were about 11 people on that panel, and that kind of cemented my love of sword and sorcery. And uh, now I am editing for the rights holders for the Conan license and working on some of the original works, which is an absolute mind trip, so. I'm Howard Andrew Jones. Uh, I've written for St. Martin's. I've got the uh, uh, two series there, the Chronicles of the Sword and Sand, or the Adventures of Debir and Seam, which is sort of Arabian fantasy. Uh, the Ringshorn trilogy, which is more sort of epic fantasy through a Roger Zelazny lens. Uh, and I just signed a five book contract with Bain uh, last yeah, month, so I'm yeah. still really excited and uh, <laughs> a little bit in disbelief and that'll be a, a sword and sorcery series. Um, first novel's coming out next year at about this time. Um, and I think the reason I'm here, in addition for my love of sword and sorcery, is I, I used to edit the Black Gate, uh, and I now edit uh, Tales from the Magician's Skull, which is a sword and sorcery magazine. Yeah, I'm up here, Black Gate, I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is, we'll have a lead into this. So we have, <laughs> uh, there, we have another panel that's specifically on, like, uh, actually there's two on Sword and Sorcery. One is later today at four, and many of the panels will be reappearing there. Um, very similar topic, uh, that's gonna be like in the Renaissance of Sword and Sorcery specifically. This one is a bit broader with Pulp. Um, and there's actually, uh, uh, on Friday at, uh, sorry, Saturday at five, we have a kind of a Sword and Sorcery pastiche one, which overlaps with the interest of people who might, might be here. Um, and um, 
Yeah, so I wouldn't pitch pitch that. So we'll we will we can discuss sword and sorcery obviously because this is a big part of pulp, but it, it could be you know today will be um, broader than that. So I guess we should start off just to make sure we're all on the same page and just quickly discuss the definition of pulp and what we're thinking about that. Um, but so we'll go through a round of that. But it, 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 as we do that, maybe you can add a, a bit of a spin of well, uh, pulp's origins is it, is it literally in pulp, and, and well, we're kind of beyond pulp now in our society. So maybe as you talk about something about your experience and that the, your, the growth uh, of pulp, you can maybe throw out a quick comment about where you think it is today. So, um, let's start off with Jason. We'll take, oh, right. yeah. oh, oh, all right. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, because well, you, actually your thesis was, uh, was on yeah. modernity, but so you don't, don't read through the whole thesis yet. Yeah, but, no, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. yeah right. uh, lecture on the modernity. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, so like two, uh, pulp, when we talk about pulp, there's going to be the um, specific print media from the 19, um, uh, 20s and 30s. It's before that, but it really has a heyday in the 1920s and 30s. It was printed on acid-rich paper, so it yellowed very quickly. To collect it is really hard because it starts to fall apart. You know, it's, it's hard to read these pulps because they'll snap in your hand. Um, there's things you need to keep in mind. They were um, uh, distributed um, through um, newsstands, so the pulp companies had their own trucks and so they didn't send it through the, there were some that sent, were, were sent through the mail, but a lot of them were um, dropped off at, at tobacco stands and new stands, and so you have, you had to go to the, the, um, the, the place to get it. So also, because it was at a new stand, they had to make the covers really eye-catching, right? So you get this whole tradition of pulp art, or the you know, the, the beautiful, colorful things. Um, so that's the print, you know, um, history of pulp. But then there's also the, um, when we talk about pulp fiction today, it's, it's, it's not, it's trans-historical, right? It's more of like an aesthetic, right? Fast-paced storytelling, um, you know, uh, there's, there's certain tropes like detective fiction is a pulp genre, cosmic horror is a pulp genre, sword and sorcery is a pulp genre. Um, it's, it's a complicated question. Like what, mm -hmm. what do we mean when we talk about pulp when we're not referring to like that specific magazine type, uh, that style? What, what, what is a pulp style? So that's, that's how I would start the conversation is there's this, you're referring to those specific magazines in the 1920s and 30s, and then you're referring to something that's more like a style. Right. Jim? So a lot of pulp was also in like what were known as the lab mags and the men's adventure magazines and that sort of thing. So uh, a lot of it is, like you were saying, very lurid and fast paced and exciting because you were trying to capture people's interest and make them keep buying these things. Um, and so you get a lot of these very manly men doing these big things, but you also got a lot of uh, surprisingly strong female characters. Uh, some of Pulp had some of the early uh, diversity and representation in science fiction. And so I think that that's something that we're rediscovering now is that for its time, Pulp actually could be very progressive. Uh, obviously, it's couched in the language of the 20s and 30s, so there's still a lot you have to go back and kind of clean out um, and make, you, you have to do a little bit of interpretation of, you know, what's actually problematic just in and of itself and what is problematic based on, you know, actual language of the time. So for me, that's an interesting thing now that we're looking at some of those early roots and going, there's still a lot of great stories here, you know, it's, Honestly, Marvel is a great example of pulp in a lot of ways because you've got those serial characters and that great action adventure. So I think that's maybe where we're going now is more serialized, engaging stories uh, centering heroes that you may see over and over again. Nice. Howard? Well, I'm trying to think how to follow both of those up. <laughs> uh, it kind of feels like they covered it uh, in, in really fine detail. Okay. Uh, Richard, do you have any comments there? I, well, yeah, I think that, um, well, like I said, I agree with everything that's been said. I think that, you know, kind of the, the aesthetic of Pulp Fiction is it kind of consistently favors that which is exciting and colorful over that which is maybe plausible and realistic if you really start to think about it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, flat out glory and see the sword and sorcery stories that somebody is telling today uh, that you can uh, look at, at certain books you know, like that are hitting the bestseller list that we don't necessarily think of as pulp, but if you really look at how they're being done, that they're, they're very much in the pulp tradition. I, I, I read all the um, books from Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child, both the things they do in collaboration and the things they do separately, 
And uh, you look at a character like a special agent, Pendergast, you know, he is very obviously a cult hero, and he has these outrageous adventures that, uh, that are very much um, in, in, the, in the pulp tradition. I mean, so it, you, I guess that you can look at things like the sword and sorcery story that somebody writes and say, well, by God, that's pulp. But you can even look at some other things like that are marketed as Main Street Thrower and say, well, yeah, sure, that's pulp. Too. I guess I should say that um, we talked about detective fiction being one of the things that started in the pulp. So we've been talking more about the lurid end of the scale, and certainly there's some lurid detective fiction. But let us not forget that Raymond Chandler uh, was in the pulps in Black Mask and, and Dash of Hammett. And of course, these guys basically created the genre. Uh, and there's just some beautiful writing. And so there's, there's problems with pulp. There's uh, some over-the-top stuff. It's not that there's anything wrong with that. I love a good over-the-top story as much as everyone else. I mean, I edit Tales from the Magician's Skull. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's also some just the strengths of uh, pulp are found there from the very beginning in some of these stories as well, the, the direct action, some of the beautiful lyric prose, uh, characters who act rather than are acted upon, characters who don't stand around whining, they figure out the problem and uh, take steps. And I, I love that. I have so little patience for uh, characters who whine and emote <laughs> instead of addressing <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's hey, <laughs> Hey, Jason? Yeah. Go. yeah. No, just uh, you want, I wanted to say that there's a stereotype that pulp fiction is written by um, hacks that move as pound out as quickly as possible and they don't think about craft. But you mentioned Chandler and Hammett and Lovecraft and Howard. These writers, if you look at their letters and, or, and, and you read their essays, like all of these writers were like highly um, thoughtful about writing. Right? They, they thought of it as a, as a craft. Right? They, they um, you know, Half of what they write to each other is talking about, you know, like almost literary criticism. You know, so this the stereotype of the pulp writer who doesn't think about their craft is. That, I'm not saying that they were very much into the market. They were trying to write, you know, entertaining stories that would sell. They weren't like T. S. Eliot, like kind of navel gazing <laughs> about art. But they were they were like carpenters. They really wanted their work to be good. You know. Well, sure. And someone that I think we haven't mentioned yet, we should, and we were talking about. I think you and I were talking about yesterday, Clark Ashton Smith. He's not as well known as a lot of the authors, and I have a soft spot for him because he wrote about my hometown. Like some of the buildings he wrote about, I've been in, and I know the area really well, so there's a personal connection. But you know, you you learn new vocabulary <laughs> reading his stuff. He writes, he he wrote such smart stuff, and he was a contemporary of Howard and Lovecraft. I mean. One of his favorite hobbies was beating uh, Lovecraft over the head for being a creepy racist. Like, mm -hmm. his letters are hilariously aggro, <laughs> like, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so those are fun, too. But he was smart. And I, I think that's a really good point, that sometimes, you know, one of the things in writing is that you have to know the rules to break them. And a lot of these folks were so successful because they really understood how to write, and then they intentionally took those tropes and those uh, pastiches and just leaned into them so hard and built them out. Like, I love Howard's writing because he has this lyrical, action-packed sense that is just, it's not bombastic, but it's so exciting and so just keeps you moving forward. Cool. Well, I think we'll, we'll divide some of our topics into uh, well, I want to delve into what the craft of what you'd expect out of pulp in just a second, but I, I want to double check our declaration on the panel to saying <laughs> pulp is back. Yep. Um, we indicated maybe elements of it are now, but I guess I'll pose that question to you guys. Um, is it really back? Um, or, or do you think that's the case? It, it feels it, to me like there's a sort of a resurgence that's been going on for a while now. How much steam it is really gathering, I don't know. I believe that we are seeing echoes of it in different places. The Marvel movies, that's a good example. That's a kind of a pulp. The, uh, some of these thrillers certainly have a feel. But we haven't mentioned web fiction yet. Now, I haven't spent a whole lot of time exploring it, but certainly some of the characteristics of this web fiction where it's serial and it's written quickly and people apparently just devour it. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly feels a lot like a modern brand of pulp. And then, of course, there's all kinds of uh, people are coming back and getting licenses to do The Shadow and some of these other uh, characters. And then you have uh, stuff like uh, The Skull or Whetstone and a number of other publications that are taking, sort of drawing from the same well, but trying to uh, uh, do it in a slightly new way. Right, right? I, 
interrupt you just for a moment about the tail. So you guys made a design choice for that magazine to make it feel pulpy with the paper, which is a bold statement, actually, because I think sometimes people whine, they want it in different forms, and it's like, wait a second, I don't know if you could just well, discuss yeah, that real quick. Sure, you, you so we chose, uh, we did really well in the first Kickstarter for Tales from the Edition Skull, and Joseph Goodman, the guy who runs Goodman Games and publishes the Skull, uh, said, you know, we made a little extra money, let's go for a really high quality paper. So, of course, pulp isn't high quality paper, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but it has sort of this yellow textured look to it, so it feels like pulp, but it doesn't disintegrate. <laughs> so, so that's what we went with for the first few issues until uh, COVID hit, and then it was like a thousand extra dollars per per uh, issue to get the, so until the supply line trades out, we're back to ordinary paper, but yeah. Okay. And the double columns too, that's very much. Yeah, we do the double columns and a skull. Uh, the skull's the mascot, and he introduces the every issue. Yeah. So, Richard, do you think pulp is back or not? I think it's back as a. Um, I, I, I think it's back as a, as a aesthetic, you know, as, as a storytelling approach. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we're likely anytime soon to see, you know, rats of authentic pulp magazines, <laughs> you know, the dominating, you know, newsstand springing if up. You, and, and so you see pictures yeah. of, of like 1930s, yeah. and, and you see this just amazing display on the newsstand, and you're like, oh my god, if I could travel back in time right. and just stand there, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, was going to say that, I definitely don't think we'll see a resurgence of some of the really niche, stranger, the strange pulps, you know, you're probably not going to see a, you know, like, you know, Zeppelin gorilla cowboy stories. I mean, <laughs> soon, you know? There might be a market for that. More yeah. 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 Although, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, let's talk about what you maybe what you expect out of the pulp and how you could apply it to today's medium, whether it's print or, or web. I don't know. Um, Jane, what, what do you think about the, the, the elements of, of pulp and maybe how you can apply it to today's? I mean, it kind of touches on the last question a little bit, too, but. Look at gaming. I think gaming is one of the best examples we have of modern pulp because you're centering the hero, you're centering doing these things. And we call it, you know, the murder hobo thing now, but I mean, it's not that different. Like, a lot of the pulp was soaked in just death and, you know, destruction and these big uh, world altering events and all these things. And that's what you're doing in gaming. And so I think if you look at games like D&D, those are, in a lot of ways, the new pulp. Uh, you're getting a lot of content for them. You have a lot of people with recurring characters. You know, you look at the things like Ari Salvatore. That just is, in many ways, a pulp hero. Uh, he's just the more tortured, dark, yeah. you know, my life is not going great sort of <laughs> hero. Um, so I think we see a lot of that. And especially in gaming, you can have a lot more niche things. Uh, I did a panel yesterday where it was design a, a module live and we were talking about setting and the things people are coming up with were like, you know, weird west, pulpy, early stuff and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is fun. And I think that's something that we kind of have missed for a lot of years. You know, I come from traditional publishing. We forgot to have fun. And pulp is fun. So that's, I think that's going to be a big element going forward is recapturing that. Yeah, yeah. Up, up, um, be the uh, uh, iconoclast and, and, and work against the concept. But I don't yeah. think pulp ever went away. Like okay. it's always been there. Yeah. Like the um, pulp magazine publishers, they went, and a lot of them just became comic book publishers, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the pulp heroes became superheroes, right? Or they went the adult route. You know, they became gentlemen's magazines. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Gary E. Gygax, right? Mm -hmm. He. Um, Read Weird Tales. Um, he had used copies of Weird Tales. He got them. His dad gave them to him from for, for stores. But um, you look at the appendix in it. Yes. So many of those authors are a pulp, and I completely agree <coughs> with the gaming connection. It's like <coughs> this this um, tradi pulp tradition has never went away. It's been below the surface. I think maybe people are starting to realize that there is a literary origin to the pulp tradition, and that's what's happening. Is people are kind of realizing that that archive of, of literature is is important and it's worth preserving and you know, it's worth thinking about, and it's like a museum piece, you know, that needs to be thought about and, and responded to. Right. Okay. Well, I guess I have a couple of thoughts that maybe we could uh, discuss. I think we have a lot of writers in the crowd, I assume. It is a writer symposium. So let's let's pose that someone wants to 
write their first pulp and, and store it. I don't know. Could, like, could we discuss some things you might want to aim for? Obviously, you could emulate other authors, but uh, I mean, try to think of these elements of what you expect in, in a story. Someone might uh, maybe. How would you guide? Uh, a, a young author or sorry, an early author uh, in, in trying this out. I have a very opinionated take on that. <laughs> yes, good. All right, all right, all right, yes, okay. All right, should I try to step away? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you want it to be fast moving and propulsive. You want it to hook you from the beginning. Uh, you want the characters to act rather than be acted upon, which is a pet peeve of mine with a lot of, a lot of modern stuff. Um, you want a sense of wonder and excitement. You don't want it to be, s it could be grim, but you don't want it so hopeless that oh, you, you come away reading it with your shoulders slumped. If there's something grim, you want the heroes to triumph at the end or at least escape alive most of the time. Mm -hmm. Sort uh, of alive. Yeah, sort of alive, right? <laughs> alive ish. <laughs> right. <laughs> so so there's some, there's, there's one school of uh, modern fiction which I kind of like, but not in great amounts, and uh, uh, it's the grimdark. Uh, I have some favorite writers who write grimdark, but I don't read it very often because some grimdark is uh, everything's hopeless, everything's covered in crap, and everyone's a bastard. And that's not fun in great amounts <laughs> for me. You don't see the connection to fun. No, no I don't see the connection to fun, you know? Uh, so what I'm looking for like in the skull is stuff where there's a sense of wonder. Take me someplace that I have never imagined. I want to I wanna go there. That's really fascinating. Uh, give me a colorful character. Give me interesting places. Give me interesting people doing things in those interesting places. Uh, give me forward momentum. Uh, also, in Modern Pulp, why don't we leave the suspect racism and politics behind? We can take uh, we can take the good stuff, all the wonderful things, and just you know we don't. There's there's one school that feels like if we're doing the modern stuff, then we got to imitate the old stuff slavishly. It's like well, uh, it was a different time, and some of it's quite unintentional. Um, some of it wasn't, but a lot of it was. Uh, but we don't need to imitate that part of it. Why would we imitate all the awesome stuff and leave the rest behind? Awesome. Uh, Richard, do you have thoughts for us? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with everything that you said. It was kind of with the stipulation that I think that in, uh, if you're doing like a kind of pulp horror story, then, you know, they can't die. Yeah, end. exactly. <laughs> uh, or, you know, it, it, or, it, you can even, or you can even have kind of a a more passive protagonist that the bad shit just happens to. Right. Uh, well, there you saw my predisposition towards yeah. adventure stories versus right. Lovecraft. Yeah. 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 And I, mean, I, I think that uh, I think that the my bias is that the more is that the longer the horror story is, the uh, more impatient I'm likely to get with a passive protagonist. Sure. But I think that if you're doing like a short horror pul pulpish kind of story. Uh, you know, it, that will work. All that said, though, I think that you, I think that in doing, uh, in, in, in doing like modern pulp, you kind of want to, you kind of want to have a sense of what's been done a lot of before, and then and, and maybe, um, and, and maybe try to take it, to think of it, take it, how to take it in a little different direction, like in the case of uh, uh, the Cthulhu mythos. I don't think we need another story about a, uh, <laughs> a about a twitchy young scholar moving into the wrong house or reading the wrong <laughs> book, or, or you know I don't need to see another uh, deep one wade up onto the beach. You know, I mean, it's just kind of uh, I've been there with all that already. I, I think that I think you can take the um, I think you can take the, the feeling and the concepts and the virtues of that of those of these old great old stories, but then find a little something new to do with a little different twist. Yeah, so, so stuff that seemed wondrous back then, we've either read it and now we need to have a different type of uh, well, I wonder to feed the wolves. Yeah, yeah, before you before you begin to write in earnest, have a sense of the history before you start doing it. I'll never forget talking to one person who really wanted to write some science fiction and after talking with them for just a few minutes, it was clear to me they'd never actually read any. Like, well, <laughs> well that's strange. What? <laughs> what? You know the whole. Oh, hey, I've got this great idea where uh, it turns out that the the people who crash land on the planet are actually Adam and Eve. It's it's really like, well, you know, it's been done about eighty, 80 times. times. Yeah. Yeah. Something that 
uh, I think is worth studying is to me, Bold is very cinematic. Um, in a lot of ways, when you're reading it, it's almost more like movie pacing, where you're not getting down really into the details, you're hitting the highlights. So it's like, obviously I'm a little immersed in Conan right now, so this is a, you know, where I'm drawing this from, but it's, what would you see on screen? And so sometimes studying and breaking down some, you know, some of those movies, like, I think Guillermo del Toro is a great example of this. I think he was heavily inspired by Pulp, and you can see that, like Mountains of Madness is one of his pet projects. Um, and so when you watch his movies, you get that sense of wonder and that really just larger than life, and he's drawing from Lovecraft in a very modern, non-American way. Um, as I was saying, listening, one of my favorite books, Mr. Shivers by Robert Jackson Bennett, is a modern American folk classic. You have a guy who his family is taken from him and he decides to go and challenge death itself. Like it, the entire journey is him traveling, hunting down mm -hmm. death to exact revenge for his wife and child dying. And again, it's big and cinematic, but it's very quiet. And so it's a great example of how you can take the really action forward sort of thing and make it eerie and creepy and just really, really uh, very American. It's, it's really an, an American mythology, which I think actually is, Pulp is American mythology. It's, it's, a, it's primarily US and it really is kind of our, our <coughs> gods and, and heroes sort of thing. And that's a really excellent point because uh, the Westerns, are a purely American thing, and they were a huge component of the original pulp westerns. Are, uh, they may not be dead, but they're on life support. Dime novels. Yeah, dime novels, starting from the very beginning. That was really the earliest pulp yep. were those western dime novels. Yeah. Jacob? I was going to say, like, um, pulp solves a different kind of problem than, like, other literature does. Like, since the 19th century, like, novels were supposed to morally train you, right? The idea you read a Dickens novel to be a better person after you read it. That's not the problem that Pulp solves, and we're a little guilty about it. What Pulp does <laughs> is it inoculates you from the real world, right? You need, like, uh, 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 that's a kind of a horrible metaphor to use, oh, we're all wearing masks, but like, it does. It <laughs> like, inoculates you from the world so that you can kind of take a breath and, and kind of escape into this into this wonderful place where the stakes aren't so high. Or they're, they're high, but it's different, right? You have it's power in there. Yeah. Right. And it, it reminds me that we go back to the history of the Pulps, who were reading these. I mean, it's not, there, there were exceptions to the rules. There were actually some really surprising people who were reading the pulps who were not working class, but the, it was actually a working class literary tradition. The people who were reading these had horrible day jobs. They were came, came home with grease on their hands. They, they were just, you know, they worked as oil roughnecks. You know, H Howard was a, you know, in an oil boom town. Like, so like part of it, I think is, if I was to give, I would never really give advice to writers because I'm, I'm a, an amateur writer myself. But if I did, I was like, write, write something that would make me briefly forget the world. I don't know how you do it, but do it. <laughs> you know? I, I think that with pulp though, there a lot of pulp there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, you know, improving the reader, some that comes in, sneaks back in the back door. I mean these a lot of in in the sense that a lot of pulp characters are kind of inspirational and aspirational, you know, it's like, boy, if I could be a little bit more like Doc Savage, how cool would that be, you know? And uh, so I think th I, I definitely agree with you that it's like pulp, good pulp fiction is definitely not the kind of fiction that's hammering you, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, with theme that's not up in Sinclair and the jungle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, but I, I think that there's a little something there. I don't think it's entirely devoid of, uh, of value in terms of making the reader better. Well, and to Richard's point, I, one of the reasons that Gemmel grabbed me so hard was when I started reading him, I was coming out of a far-right, ultra-conservative Christian background and seeing these heroes who did the right thing, who put their lives, you know, a second to their codes of honor and to their need to do what was right for the world, even if it was a great personal cost to themselves. Like, I, you know, I joke, but it's not entirely wrong. Um, one of the heroes of one of the early stories that I read was Jane Greymock. And like my name <laughs> has a lot of similarities to that, but his code of honor was hugely impactful on me. So I think that you know, you're both right, where it's giving you that escapism, but it's an aspirational escapism of 
I can do the thing. I can take control of my own destiny and of the people who matter to me, and I can make a difference. And for me, that's really powerful. If I were raised in the jungle and had eight friends, I would be <laughs> <like, laughs> a yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Well, I have one last question. Well, I have others. One more main <laughs> question to tackle before uh, we start thinking, you know, fielding questions from the crowd. So get ready, raise your hands, and all that stuff. So I, I wanted to go back and touch on detective fiction a little bit because it's a little bit different, or maybe could be perceived different than the obvious action hero. But obviously, it was important. So I just wanted to address that topic on the, uh, any order. But I guess did you guys have thoughts on uh, the detective pulse? Well, yeah. I'm now going to undercut what I just said about okay. the pulp not having a message. But if you yeah. look at detective fiction, the hard boiled detective fiction. It's very much anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. It's um, even though the actual private detectives were anti-union, you have the in the fictional world of the de de detective, the private detectives are very much like pro-working class and like they're they're going to city hall. They're li sometimes literally going to city hall and like punching some, a bureaucrat in the face, <laughs> and get, like a record or something. So, yeah, um, I'd say that that's part of the the fault to, to kind of echo the aspirational. And connected to detective. Well, I would say that I think it's neglected. I didn't get around to it until uh, I was in my 40s. And it's like, oh my God, this stuff is great. Why have I not read this any sooner? We don't discuss it. Uh, when we're kids, I grew up in the uh, 70s and the 80s, and we were trading around all sorts of great stuff. Don't get me wrong, great fantasy literature. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know about uh, Hammett and Chandler. That seems like adult literary fiction. Is, no, this is great adventure stuff. I mean, there's wonderful themes in lyrical writing, but this is great adventure stuff. And uh, yeah, if you haven't read it, uh, Chandler and, and Hammett and uh, Frederick Neville and um, oh my God, I could go on and on. I mean, if you want to go later, Ross McDonald, and that uh, wow, the the prose is so beautiful, and yet the pacing is there too, and the characters have depth, and the mysteries are solid. It's just. Yeah, go back and read those detective guys if you haven't read them. And gals, Lee Brackett wrote some too, and Lee mm -hmm. Brackett's one of my very favorites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wasn't Washington Chandler who said, uh, you know, who, who said that you know, whatever things look like they're slowing down in the story, have a man come through the door with a gun? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very cold sentiment, yeah. I mean, Sherlock was, in a lot of ways, one of the early detective pulp things and look how popular those stories still are. I mean, we're still getting movies regularly and TV mm -hmm. shows that are great. You know, it's true. It's like yeah. we have Sherlock, but we forgot everyone in between yeah. Sherlock and now. And there's some mm -hmm. great stuff. And I, I really would be interested to see if some of those rights start getting picked up as you know some of this comes back a little bit. Uh, but again, with detective fiction, you started getting a lot of women featuring in these stories. and. A lot of them were the, you know, either the villain or the or to be saved. But I think that was one of the early places where you started seeing women getting some sense of agency and some importance in the story. There's also the, the figure, uh, like in Red Harvest. I, I know it's a, um, it's a villain character, but it's actually sometimes villains can kind of reverse read them and like kind of see them as heroes. But like the gun mole figure is very powerful, or the flapper that shows up in the detective fiction. Mm -hmm. There's some, there's some, uh, it's not just. Um, well, they're treated like real people. Exactly. Yeah. These, yeah. these are just good writers. They're treated like real people with real motivations and, and real reasons for what they do. And some the bad guys aren't all bad. You can understand them. Sometimes they have, uh, they're looking out for somebody or, yeah, yeah it's just a lot better than its reputation. Uh, if, if people want to read a, ha a Hammett novel, Red Harvest is a good one. But my favorite one is The Dane Curse. I love that book. That's a good one, too. Yeah. So, uh, questions from the crowd? I want to get a rough idea of how many people might have questions. So that'll help me guide stuff. All right, cool. So, um, we'll do you second with the man in the bandana, or the person I can't even see for that part. You, you, <laughs> you either. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. You have a question? Very one of the really mm -hmm. incredible things about how we can put the character on the page and instantly know everything you need to know about them, we can move on with the story. 
pulp writers seem to have this capacity to create characters in very few strokes. It's a false stereotype that there are very flat characters in pulp fiction. Mm -hmm. We're constantly great pulp writers buck against that. Do you have any suggestions or any thoughts gleaned from the pulp writers about creating such powerful and memorable characters in so few strokes? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going to happen again. <laughs> so look at what's happening. The characters are shown acting. Uh, they're veterans of what they're doing. All They don't talk about their experience. We see them using their experience uh, dynamically. Uh, they're clever, they're resourceful, and we get a sense through watching what they're doing that they know what they're doing. Um, and they're not mindless action scenes. That's another th thing. I could go into too much depth about that, but it's just not action for the sake of action. Something is at stake from the very beginning. Uh, and it gets us involved in them and seeing what they're capable of doing. Uh, also, I guess just it's so important that they're experienced veterans. We're not uh, getting their long backstory. If they have a backstory, maybe we'll find out over the course of the story. The backstory is not important. Um, it's very present. Yeah. Present, yeah. Um, I think maybe the, um, the really important thing is that these characters are based on very simple principles without being cliche. Um, you know, your t-shirt is RuneQuest, and I think that's a great example of pulp in <laughs> modern gaming. Like, <laughs> the stuff that uh, is coming out from RuneQuest and some of the related properties is great pulp storytelling. But if you look at Conan, I mean, he is now a stereotype. But at the time, he was a very simple character, and I mean, Howard calls that out. So a simple man who is from the wilds, he doesn't understand civilization, it's, it's strange to him. He doesn't have a lot of depth up front. When you first see him, like you said, first page, you know what he's about. And then later you start getting some, some details. But his going into his head isn't important, it's what he's doing, it's his actions playing out on the page. And the, you know the, that phrase, actions speak louder than words. If you have someone going out and doing something, you can show who they are and what they stand for much faster than if you're like, okay, so in his childhood, you know, this had an impact on him for this thing. And that's a valid storytelling technique, but it's not pulp because it's too nebulous. It's not giving you that, like, grab you by, by the vest, this is the character. I mean, I think that what, I think that what the, the key is that this goes kind of twofold. You you start out, you know, very much as Howard said, you've got a you've got a, a character who is you know immediately striking, and then and you sense to open with him doing something interesting. So right away you have this you know you have this attachment to this character, this interest to in this character, this ability to see this character, and then as the story goes, as the story goes along, or maybe the series of stories goes along, you can start dropping in little bits of this and that to you know create a more Deep and three-dimensional character, but uh, you, you do that without uh, without slowing things down and, and without compromising that very dynamic opening that you you used to set your hook. I, I guess let me just add one more thing, and that is that he may not tell the reader everything about the. So a lot of modern writers they'll tell you their entire backstory of the character that they've worked out ad nauseum before. So. Howard knew all this background about his character. He had a sense of his depth. Tower of the Elephant, he knows that Conan is the kind of guy who would spare Yad Kasha at the end, right? But the reader doesn't know that at the start. So before you start writing this character, think this character through, knowing backwards and forwards, you don't communicate that through his uh, telling the reader, you just show the reader. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. compressed and economic characterization. Yeah. I'm thinking of like in the opening of Dasha Hammett's uh, The Maltese Falcon, when uh, the, the, the detective, what's his name? Uh, Sam Spade. Spade. Yeah. He rolls a cigarette with one hand, which is like, you know, very cool. You know, like, you know this person's <laughs> in charge of it. And then Conan, he's always described as having like this uh, collage of different cultures. You know, he has a Hyrconian helmet and a Stygian um, you know, waste coat to blah, blah blah. So he's like a, you know, he's a person of a well trod. He's trod over the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I, I'm, I'm speaking as a reader rather than a writer. But it seems like economic and compressed characterization mm -hmm. is, is 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 part of it. 
Okay. Sean, let's go hit you up, and then we'll get the next person. Yep. One of the cool things about, I guess, watching the pulp revival of sorts has been it's been very much led by the small presses, the indies, the self-publishers, and like anything led by the small presses, the indies, the self-publishers, Trad Pub has taken notice. If you could tell the Trad Publishers sniffing around the pulp stuff, <laughs> how would, should they keep that pulp spirit alive if they want to do that without losing that sort of self-starting spirit we've seen in the Indies? I think one of the first things you do is tap the people who've been doing it rather than the people who suddenly get wind of it and want to imitate it. Because there's people who've been out there fighting for it for 20 years or more, um, and some of them are very capable and instead, uh, someone will come along who's really well known and say, oh, uh, I will try that, <laughs> you know, and then they'll slap it all over, but they don't really understand it because they're not really into it. You I know? know just who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that you do. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I don't know that, yeah. Uh, no, that is not a side swipe that... Um, uh, a fellow is act I'm actually friendly with. No, okay. uh, I've just seen I stuff happen like that before, yeah. where uh, uh, someone jumps on the bandwagon because it's cool, and then they steal all the oxygen, where the people who are actually doing some cool stuff don't get the backing. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I mean, uh, I feel like from the beginning of the pulp of the pulps, there has been like this intense relationship between the readers and the writers and the editors. Like if you look at Weird Tales, you read all the fiction, but you forget those last six pages, which are the eerie, and it's like the readers saying, I hated this story, I love this story. And I know that's like a general co comment about fandom, right? But um, because like I think what's, what's interesting about Whetstone is all the people who read it are also submitting you stories. You know? So I don't know how that, you can't publish everyone, but you know, <laughs> like, uh, there has to be some sort of, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Um, Curation that happens, but um, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 and the like. Uh, we read the letters of the pulp writers too, so the correspondence of the pulp writers is, is fascinating. We, I think a lot of us. I'm not speaking as like a pulp fan and a pulp writer. Like a lot of us try to emulate the the, um, the pulp writers' correspondence through things like Discord and um, email. And like Dave, David C. Smith, um, mm -hmm. I we we. I, I think he wants his letters published, he pr pr probably not, but mm. he writes really <laughs> long emails and they're yeah. awful reflective yeah. emails like a pulp writer. Yeah. Two things. I don't think, th so there's the sense that for something to be viable and grown up, traditional publishing needs to pick it up, and I don't think that's the case. I think pulp is something that is perfectly suited for the small press. Um, I helped found a publishing house called Full Stop Books, and we're in the uh, the mold of like Nightshade and some of those others that in the 90s and thousands were really strong and really contributed a lot to bringing up some of these voices that are now powerhouses in the industry. But what we specifically look for, we call ourselves the island of the misfit toys because it's we want those stories that aren't going to work in traditional publishing. And I think Pulp is a great example of that, where it doesn't necessarily work in traditional publishing in a lot of ways, because you need that steady content. You need the stories that probably aren't going to get great critical response. Um, and so you need to have the ability to churn out a lot of stuff, get relationships with the readers. Mm -hmm. have well, is that the heart of Sean's question? Is it, yeah. you know, can Pulp actually be part of the mainstream press might be another way of yeah. Paraphrasing that. I, I think there's so. some space. Yeah. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, Howard's about to do five books that prove that it is, right? Yeah. I mean, well, here's uh, here's <laughs> open, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I I mean, yeah. yes, I think it's viable in small press, but by God, I'd like to make a living writing it. So <laughs> small press can't make me a living. So yeah. Well, the other thing is you've got Amazon fiction, and we've got people who are making great livings for themselves. In, I would say that Amazon fiction and related, even fan fiction in some cases where it's monetized through Patreon or something mm -hmm. like that, is in a lot of ways the new serial pulp That's storytelling because it's cheap, it's honestly mm -hmm. often not edited, <laughs> and let's be honest, a lot of those early pulps were not getting a great <laughs> oversight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, can, can I add to what you just yeah. said? That's really important because like, when we talk about pulp today, we're often talking about the pulp canon. There mm -hmm. is like 
99% of that stuff is just unreadable. Like, I had this idea that, like, I'm going to read all of Weird Tales. And so I got <laughs> all these facts <laughs> and I started reading it. And, like, the, you know, of 128 pages, mm -hmm. the one, like, Lovecraft or Howard or Clark Ashton's mm -hmm. story was the only thing that was tolerable. And that's not always the case. There's some gems that you find. Yeah. But it, like, if you don't trust me, give it a try yourself. Uh, yes, it's Sturgeon's Law, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we only got a little bit of time left, so I want to get one last question, at least for the, or maybe two, and we'll see if we, we make it quick. So first, the, the right behind yeah. Nicole. Um, <laughs> so maybe this is a limitation of my yeah. own reading, but I kind of strongly associate Pulp with the iconic hero. You know, Sherlock, Conan, they don't really grow or change through the story, they just act on the plot. So my question is, do you ever send your Pulp hero on a journey of growth? And if you do, how does that change how you write the poem? I have opinions here. Okay, have opinions, but to make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, Conan has a huge journey. I mean, you get into the keen Conan, the older Conan mm -hmm. stuff. It's just on a bigger time scale. And with a lot of other books, you'll have that growth happening in one uh, novel. Mm -hmm. But with Conan, it was a lifetime. Like, I don't know where Howard would have gone with him if he would lived past his early 30s. But... Conan has a huge growth arc from this just simple, problematic early start, and it mirrors Howard's growth too. So I think absolutely send them on a journey, give them something to aspire to, give the reader a sense of progression as they learn more about the world, especially if they come from a more sheltered place, you know, like Conan's right. character did, and he starts to understand the world a lot. It's still present. It's scholar, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Still, yeah. Yes, it's, still, it's present. Mm -hmm. just that the priority at first is the the, pre the present action, yes. but the, the growth is there, but yeah. secondary. Yeah. 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 The great master and Fofford from his library are there too. Mm -hmm. Other characters where you, you definitely see how they evolve through their lives. Okay, we had one anxious question about there. We'll try to sneak it in, and then we'll do a quick wrap-up. Mm -hmm. So fire away quickly, please. Someone right about there. I think you raised your hand. No? Yeah, that's you. Yeah. You. The, uh, you were talking earlier about uh, the sense of wonder and trying to go somewhere you've never been before. We've also talked a lot about how there's a lot of like go-to things that we love, like you know the cowboy, the detective, things like that. So uh, if someone wants to write this, how uh, do you have any suggestions for finding that nice middle ground between the archetypal classic idea and the brand new wondrous location? Ooh, that's tricky. That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, the You'll have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, sense of, the sense of wonder is easier to do if you're doing science fiction or fantasy pulp, obviously. Uh, if you're going to be doing detective pulp, then show us, uh, show us grandeur, uh, you know. A dark rich, city. Dark city, rich man's mansion. Uh, we might have seen some permutation of that. But not this particular permutation. Just like in an adventure story, oh, uh, we've seen a, a time lost tomb before, but we haven't seen this time lost tomb, right? I, uh, I read a lot of uh, Lauren Espelman, who is a, a mystery writer, who has a very much in cult and stuff. And in most of his detective books, maybe in all of them, Detroit, where he lives, is a really realized place. I mean, it is. It, it, he managed to be, the books are interesting partly because of all the things he tells you about Detroit, so. That's a really, that's a really excellent point. And what you said about the city, uh, so Chandler, he brings, uh, he brings the West Coast to life. It's a living yeah. entity, it says. So think about that, or, or Batman's Gotham, that's very pulp. Yeah. So Look at Genius Loki uh, <laughs> type elements. That's, that's a big one. I that I think is important. Yeah. But also Guillermo del Toro is a great example there of you bring one magical element in and it changes the entire world and the way you look at it. Can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that question, like how to cue the convention, because there's a joy in like recognizing what, what you were expecting, you know, like, and then also revitalizing at the same time. Like if you can solve that, like, that would be amazing. Tell me how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that if you're doing something where it, it, there's, you know, the really strong tradition and it really, you know, the tropes are really well established and people like it, you know, it's familiarity, but at the same time they've seen it at the same time before. You eat, you you can. There, there's two ways to go. One way is you find some place to spin it a little different. You know, it doesn't have to be everything, but I mean, you find some fresh element to bring to it. Or you just have to do it with such verb and style that it, that, that it does like, yay, we've seen it before, but this is cool. We're seeing it again this way, so well realized. Yeah. 
Okay, we have time, maybe only just uh, for super quick, like 20 second goodbye notes if you have something <laughs> that you want to sneak in at the end. Um, is, is, there, is there a quick last comment? You gotta, well, I'm, I'm going to be in the D&D uh, author live play tonight, and I will try to do that in a public spirit. So. Okay, that'll, be fun, <laughs> and that, that'll be in one of the ballrooms. Uh, ballroom I think. one at 6 o'clock. So, okay. Just thanks yeah. to the other panelists. Yeah. Thank you. This was awesome. Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'll be taking part in a live stream later today for a game called Legacy of Mana that I did the creative writing for, which I brought a lot of my pulp uh, inspirations into, so that might be worth checking out. There are demos going on across from the exhibit hall. And I, I wanted to say thank you to uh, the audience and my fellow moder uh, my moderator, my fellow panelists, and also we would never touched upon uh, swashbuckling historical pulps, and those are fantastic. Uh, uh, Sabatini, my favorite, Harold Lamb, uh, just some wondrous stuff taking you to strange forgotten places. Check those out as well if you haven't already. Probably a lot of you have. Sabatini's <laughs> great. Read Scarlet. I love that book. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, we, uh, as a reminder too, we have a couple other sort of sorcery ones. So we have uh, another one at 4 o'clock today, which is sort of sorcery specific, and 5 o'clock tomorrow, which is closely related. So let's thank our speakers. <laughs> And uh, enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm Yeah. 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 Y